Hi, I'm Adam Porter and this is my board gaming vlog and for the last few videos, this is video number 10 in the series of my top 100 board games. Uh, that includes card games and dice games, anything you can play on the tabletop and we're down to the top 10, the very best games in the list in my opinion. These are the games that connect with me, that I have a real emotional reaction to, I've had really great experiences with, although I could highly recommend any of the games on this uh, top 10 for, for anybody to pick up and purchase is really. Number 10 on the list is the game Dominion. So Dominion is a deck building game which means that you're taking cards, um, you've, you've got a very very small deck of cards at the start that's your own individual deck that no other players can use and then when you draw a hand of cards you can use those cards as a currency to buy other cards and these cards will all go into the discard pile along with the cards that you've spent but that discard pile is going to be shuffled up and reform your deck so your deck is going to get bigger and bigger and you're going to get more and more brilliant cards into that deck as the game goes on so your turns will get better and better more and more powerful Dominion is full of variety every game you have different cards available to you uh, and so you can adjust your strategy accordingly it plays really quick I really like the game at two or three players so you can just bang 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 through your turns really quickly and there are loads and loads of expansions which really change the way the game plays when I first got this game it was very early in one of the first games that I got when I was sort of in the um, you know you know new to the the hobby gaming the the euro games and 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 this new style of game that I hadn't really come across before although I've always played games but Dominion was one uh, that, that was really pivotal in me getting into the hobby because I'd never seen anything like this and actually I've played a lot of deck building games since and I've mentioned a couple on on uh, on, on this list but I've never found anything that's quite as satisfying as just the pure deck building of Dominion. Dominion created uh, Donald X Vaccarino the, the designer of Dominion created this genre of games and it's it's um, it's, it's just so sort of engaging and, and, and just satisfying to see that engine building, you know, as your turns get better and better and better. So uh, highly recommended game, Dominion. Uh, I think if, if you haven't come across this, then really you ought to be looking at it. You ought to be checking this one out. Okay, number nine on the list is Las Vegas from Rudiger Dawn. This is a dice game. I've said several times on this list, I really like dice games that are not based around Yahtzee mechanisms. And this is one of the best. Uh, this, in this one, you, um, you roll your dice and then you take groups of dice uh, that of, of matching value and you must place all of them onto a particular casino and you've got all these various casino spaces with, with different prizes corresponding to them. So you might go for the high valued space but then you're going to be competing a lot with the other players and the great thing in this game is that if you end up tying with other players uh, with the same number of dice on one of these casinos as another player then none of the tied players get anything they're just eliminated from the competition which means that you can sneak in there with a smaller number of dice and take the prize because you weren't involved in any sort of ties and that mechanism alone makes this a really fascinating strategic game where you can sort of sneak out a victory so you, it looks like somebody's in the league because they've got loads of dice down there but then somebody else comes in they tie and you can sneak in and take the rewards um, I, I like the expansion Las Vegas, Las Vegas Boulevard uh, which adds a whole load of different modules, different ways to play, um, but all of them relatively simple. I like to change it each round, the different rules that we're playing. I know there have been various different versions of this game that have come out over the years, so I, my version is the old Alia Games version, Las Vegas and Las Vegas Boulevard, and I suspect that the later editions may have some aspects of Boulevard, but not all of it. Um, I suspect whichever version of the game you pick up will be uh, really, really good. Um, it's a great one for introducing people to the hobby, it's a great one for children and families, families but it's really good for a group of adults to play together as well so that's Las Vegas Boulevard a fantastic dice game number eight on the list is Auf Teufel komm raus uh, which is a game from Zock Verlag. Auf Teufel komm raus means the devil comes out, which is sort of an equivalent saying to, uh, in English we would say, by hook or by crook, by all, any means necessary. Okay, and this is a game that's set in the, in the sort of cauldrons of hell, the devil's cauldron that's full of coal. And you've got to go in there and pull out these pieces of coal and, uh, and, and try not to pull out a piece which has a devil symbol on it. But before you do so, all the players place bets on what is the highest amount of coal that anyone's going to pull out in this 
given round. And as the coal is pulled out, then it's kept out. So, so we get an idea because we know the distribution of these different coals. So we, if we know all the big coal is gone, then it means that in this next turn, then, then it's likely people are going to go lower. So you might have to bet quite low. But obviously you want to bet more than somebody else because you want to get better rewards um, because that's going to win you the game. There's also rewards for being the person who pulls out the most pieces of coal on your given turn or the highest value pieces of coal. And so lots of little things to gamble on. It's for me, it's a really satisfying, I said this before with the game Camel Up, you know, a game that gives you the sense of gambling and betting, but without any of the financial stakes, uh, you know, something that gives you all the excitement, but without that, um, that edge to it. And that's what Auf Teufel Komm Raus does. It makes you feel like you're gambling. It's really competitive. There's lots of opportunities to take massive risk, you know, throw loads of money in there just on the off chance because you've really got to catch up with the other players. Um, and, and, and those moments, those stand up moments where, you know, you, 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 you've got a lot of your, your poker chips and this game comes with brilliant poker chips riding on this particular draw from the, um, from the, the Devil's Cauldron and then you achieve it. it it's, uh, or, or you don't, you know, you fail miserably. But but these stand-up moments of, 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 you know, punching the air as you succeed and you, you race ahead of the other players. It's it's fantastic. Um, I, I, I don't understand why this game is is not that well known. Auf Teufel komm raus is one of my very favourite games of all time. Number seven on this list is Agricola. So Agricola is quite a um, heavy strategy game. There's a lot going on. It's quite complicated, um, but I find it really intuitive. What you're doing is building a farm. And what I love about Agricola is that everything you do makes sense. I can go, I can place out a worker onto a space that gets me some wood. And then another term, I can turn, I can place out a worker and that uses the wood to build fences. And so now I can uh, build fences on my little player board and then I can place out another worker to get myself some sheep. Now I need the fences in order to have the sheep, but I've got them, I've got my pasture, so I put my sheep in there. Now maybe I build a fireplace and I can start to cook those sheep in order to produce food, which I need for my family. And I'm gonna need lots of food because I've taken an action to increase the size of my family. And increasing the size of my family gives me more workers, which means each turn I've got more workers to send out to get more stuff. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe I, I want to build my home. I, I'm going to need extra space to house those workers. So I'm going to need to gather some more wood, some more reed, perhaps some clay to get a better house. Uh, I'm going to plant some fields to grow some vegetables, maybe some, um, some grain. And then I'm going to get myself a bread oven so I can turn that grain into bread, which is going to help me to feed my family. And so on. It's just intuitive. Even though the rule set is quite complex, it makes sense. Um, there's a lot of tension in this game. You've got to feed your family every time we get round to a harvest and your animals are going to breed and so on at a harvest time. But feeding your family is the, is the, the real crux of the game, making sure that you've got enough food um, because there's quite a penalty. If you have to go begging for food, then you're taking quite a hit in terms of victory points. The real thing that I love about Agricola is that you've got a hand of 14 cards at the start of the game, a massive hand of cards, all with different special abilities. And these are different in every game. There are loads and loads of these cards, particularly once you bring in expansion sets. And so you can you can play various drafts and things like that to make sure that you get a fair um, a fair sort of crack at getting some good card combinations. But throughout the game, you're going to be playing these cards that give you different special abilities that that make you distinct from your opponents. It means every game plays differently. It's a game that I've played mostly at two player, um, and I've had a fantastic time at it with two player. I've played this game more than most games in my collection over the years. Um, uh, but but it works well at higher player counts as well, and I'm sure many people would tell you that it's at its best if you play it with four players or five players. Um, but two players it works great, and actually it's a really good solo game as well. Um, there's a good app for it you can play. You know, I, I've, I've really explored, <laughs> dived into Agricola. I've played the alternatives like Caverna, which is a very similar game, but I always come back to Agricola because I love that card play, um, that, that hand of cards that means there's tons of variety from one game to the next. Your farm looks brilliant as you build it up. Um, I think this is, you know, if you're looking for something, you've played a few of the sort of gateway style games, your Ticket to Ride and Carcassonne and these sort of things, and you're looking for something that's a little bit more substantial, got a bit more going on, you can get your teeth stuck into, then Agricola is a great next step. Number six on my list is a Reiner Knizia game. It's Tigris and Euphrates. 
Uh, now this is a game unlike anything else that I've got really. It's a tile laying game, so you're placing tiles to build out civilizations. You're placing these leader tokens, the leaders of your civilization, and then every tile that you place that connects to them with the same color is going to generate you um, uh, cubes of that color, sort of resources I suppose. Uh, but at the end of the game you're going to score points for the resource that you have the least of. So you've got to have a good variety of these different resources. You can't just hone in on one particular resource. And in each di different sort of gathering that you have of tiles around the board, you may have one of your leaders in there, but another player may have one of their leaders in that section as well. So you've got your different communities, um, you know, with, with different powers in there, there's a little bit of tension in there, and then every now and then they'll join up and there'll be some sort of conflict, uh, which might knock one of the leaders out and lose you all of your scoring opportunities. You can build these little temples or monuments, I can't remember what they're called, um, that, that, that just generate you more and more of these cubes turn after turn after turn. But you want to be careful that one of your opponents doesn't get in there, start a conflict with you, knock you out and take control of that temple because then it's going to be generating cubes for them. This is quite a um, tricky game to get your head around at first. The rule set is not like any other, it's not complex, but it's not like any other games that, that I know, apart from the follow-up Yellow and Yangtze, which is essentially the same game, but just with some, some developments. Um, uh, but it, it, it just feels such a satisfying game. It's, it's, um, it's odd but it's really attractive, it feels really strategic, but there is a little little dose of luck in there just to keep just to keep things interesting with the, the tile draws and things like this. You never quite know what people have got behind their player screens. And when you enter into those conflicts, you don't know for sure whether you're gonna win or not. So that keeps things interesting. Um, it's a good meaty game with a simple rule set, which is what uh, Reiner Knizia is so good at creating. So Tigris and Euphrates after, um, you know, I, I don't know what year this was produced, but it's, it's got to be a good 20 years plus, um, I would say, and it still really holds up as one of the best games that I have in my collection. Number five on the list is Ticket to Ride, which I've probably mentioned quite a few times in this top 100 already, uh, because it's kind of a benchmark. This is a starting point for most people. Um, if, if people want to get into the hobby, it's pretty much always the starting, the first thing that I suggest that they get themselves a copy of. It's often something that I'd buy for somebody and give it to them as a gift if I think they're vaguely interested in board games, but they haven't really trodden into those waters yet. Ticket to Ride is simple, um, and yet it provides a really nice, substantial experience experience. It looks like a board game like those mass market board games we're familiar with, things like Monopoly and stuff like that. It's not that much of a stretch to moving to a board of similar size with plastic trains instead of our plastic hotels, um, you know, and, and, and a few cards and, and, and relatively simple rule set. I love the fact that these rules are essentially explained on a single sheet of paper. Um, and so as a result, this is a really inviting, um, approachable uh, entry point to modern board games. But the game is really, really good. It's, um, it's thoroughly enjoyable every time I play it, and you've got all these different expansions that change up the experience in different ways. They're all really good as well. I'm just amazed at how well Alan R. Moon has managed to create such a simple rule set and yet such a substantial experience, and it, it deserves all the success that it's had. Number four on my list is the game Witness. Now, Witness is a real oddity, okay? This is a four-player only game, um, and it's a kind of deduction game, almost a puzzle that you do together, the four of you, but uh, each of you has a different piece of information that's gonna help you to solve some sort of mystery or crime. So you've got one little bit of information or a couple of bits of information that no one else has access to. And what you do is you whisper that information to another player, and then they're gonna whisper to another player their in the information they know plus the information they've heard from you. And this information is gonna travel around the circle and then once everybody's shared all their various different bits of information, then all players are going to be asked a series of questions. And you're going to have to try and answer those questions accurately in order to score points 
as a group and either succeed or fail as a group um, at solving the crime. But the brilliant part of it is, of course, that um, you know that telephone system where information that you're you're giving to somebody gets changed as it goes around, as people are whispering to each other and they've misheard or misremembered what they've been told or they've misunderstood. And as a result, it's really funny. The puzzles are great. The illustration is fantastic. It looks like one of those um, band designee uh, sort of Belgian comics. It's it's um, actually got a license of Blake and Mortimer, which is um, a comic uh, in the same sort of style as Tintin and things like that. So it looks great. It's really, really unusual. The, the main downside of it is the fact that you must play it with four players. You can't play it with two, three, five. It's got to be four. And so that makes it quite hard to get to the table. Uh, and it's not a game that suits everybody, but it is a, a game that I really, I'm just so glad that I have. I wish that it was still in print. It didn't last very long. You know, it was out for a while and then before you knew it, people were saying they couldn't get hold of it anymore. Um, and I don't know whether it would ever come back into print. I can't see how a game like this uh, would sell in, in any large numbers, again, because of that four player, um, uh, four player limit. Um, but it would be nice to see it have another life and also to see something similar, maybe a follow-up or a, one with a slightly different theme or, or the same theme but just new puzzles. Um, so Witness is a game that I really, really love. I have that emotional attachment to it. It's not going to be for everybody, but if you're interested and if you can find a copy at a decent price, definitely worth picking up. Number three on my list is the game Bunny Kingdom. Now this is a game that I've played uh, more than virtually anything else. I mean, I said earlier I've played a lot of Agricola. I've played a lot of Bunny Kingdom as well. Bunny Kingdom is my wife Iris's favorite game. Um, and uh, I've, I've just got totally hooked on it too, to be honest. It's a card drafting game. So we're, we're playing a card or playing two cards and then we're passing them on. Um, and uh, and so on the two player version works slightly differently and that's what we mainly play we mainly play this at two player uh, and you're placing your bunnies onto the board and trying to occupy certain regions the bigger regions that you get you're, you're counting up how many different resources you have in that section of the board so carrots and um, you know, and, and other resources like that. And then you're multiplying it by the number of turrets you have on the various castles that you occupy within that little area of the board. And then that's going to generate you points round after round after round. There are other ways to score points. There's a lot of cards that score you in different ways for, for you know, placing your bunnies in different areas or for collecting different types of sets and things like that. Um, lots of different strategies you can try. Um, the expansion is good, Bunny Kingdom Into the Sky or In the Sky. Um, it, the, the expansion adds quite a lot of complexity to the game, uh, but it's great if you've kind of exhausted Bunny Kingdom, which, which we have, you know, and to give you more options. Um, I just think it's stunning. It's it's by Richard Garfield, who uh, created Magic the Gathering, so, I mean, it's got a good pedigree behind it. But this game is... Um, you know, it's much more substantial than you'd first think. When you first look at this, you'd think it's something really cute and silly and forgettable. But actually, you know, you, you can you can play this game and try out lots of different strategies and, and, and really explore it. And it never it never really seems to get old for, for my wife and I. Um, so, yeah, highly recommended Bunny Kingdom. I'd like to see more of this. Another expansion, maybe an underground expansion uh, would make sense, wouldn't it? We've got bunnies in the sky. We've got bunnies on the ground. What about get underground in their burrows? Let's have some more Bunny Kingdom, please. Yeah. Yellow. So number two, my second favourite board game is the game Abyss from Bombix and uh, from designer Bruno Catala and Charles Chevalier. Um, why do I love this game so much? I, I don't know. I, I really like the art style. It's dark and it's a bit creepy and all of that, but it's really, really nicely drawn. I like the underwater sort of world that they've created. I like the components, the pearls and, uh, um, you, know, you know, the little cups that you keep your pearls in. Um, it, it's also sort of lavishly produced. I really enjoy that. The actual gameplay, there's a real nice push your luck thing. You've seen a few push your luck games on my top 100 where we're turning over cards and then you're thinking, shall I keep going? Shall I keep going? Shall I keep going? Or shall I stick there? We've got that whole aspect in there, but that's not everything. Once you've got those cards, you're then using them as a sort of currency to try and get these lords and the lords have special abilities. You can choose to go for special abilities that are quite sort of passive that don't really harm other people or you can go for the real attack type stuff. You can get these locations that have different sort of set collection aspects to them so gathering up different sets in order to score victory points. 
Um, I just think there's a lot to explore. It's a puzzle that really works for me. It's a theme that really works for me. I love the first expansion, uh, Kraken. Don't like Leviathan, the second expansion quite so much, but Kraken has this um, second currency that's kind of a forbidden currency. It's nice and powerful, but if you get stuck with it, it's going to lose you victory points. Um, I really enjoy that whole side of that expansion. That adds so much to the game. I never really play without that. I just think it's great. It, I, I always look forward to playing it. I'm always up for a game of it. Um, I can't quite pinpoint exactly what it is that I enjoy, but it just is a bunch of mechanisms that mesh together just work for me so well. It's a bit of an oddity, this game, in that it looks like one of those sort of American-style games that's all about combat and, 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 and you know, you're expecting a bit of randomness and all this, but really, no, it's, it's, it's a Euro game. It's got some luck in the card draw and things like this, but essentially this is a Euro game, a strategy game that just happens to have this lavish sort of thematic arts work um, sort of plastered all over the all over the game. And number one on my list, I've talked about this game many, many times on my videos, but it's Evolution from North Star Games. Uh, I'm not separating out, separating out which Evolution, you know, we've got Evolution, we've got the Flight Expansion, the Climate Expansion, we've got Evolution, the beginning and introductory sort of version, slightly different game, but that's really nice. We've got Oceans. Evolution, just the base game alone, is a magnificent game. It's I've mentioned before that I particularly enjoy that sort of exploration of um, ecosystems and nature and how animals interact with other animals. And here, I just love how much this all sort of makes sense. I love that I can, you know, I can upgrade my species by putting a shell on it and that's going to protect it from attacks from other players. If one of the other players turns into a carnivore, they're going to struggle to get through my shell. Particularly if I put horns on my creature, now the other player is going to take some damage if they try and attack me. And if I give myself a long neck, I'm going to be able to access food that other players can't access. And what we're trying to do in evolution is eat more food than all the other players and their various species. But inevitably species are going to get eaten and people are going to evolve in such a way that they're able to get through your defenses and that's what's so satisfying about the game is is the sense of evolution that you've got your species and it's changing and adapting to the play style of the other players so everything's so dynamic it's extremely confrontational extremely interactive um, which doesn't go down well with every player people are going to be targeted and so on but but you're always able to bounce back and, and you know going in when you're playing a game about evolution that that's what the theme is going to be um, it's going to be a survival of the fittest um, the different expansions are fascinating. Flight uh, gives you access, of course, to, to different food sources and different types of powers. Um, if you're playing with climate, then you're also adapting to, to the different changing weather conditions, whether you're going into a cold uh, sort of ice age or whether you're going into a tropical sort of um, environment and, and you're going to have to adapt your species to the, to the weather conditions as well to ensure that they're not dying off because of overheating or underheating, you're changing their body size to adapt to these different things, and yet the mechanisms in the game are really simple. We've essentially got multi-use cards, which I've mentioned again a few times on this list. So the cards can be used, um, you know, you can discard cards to increase your population size or to increase your body size, or you can use the cards as traits um, to improve your species, or you can throw a card away to, to increase the amount of food that's available to all players at the start of each round. Um, the game Oceans takes the evolution system under the sea, uh, and so now we're looking at aquatic creatures um, with a slightly different rule set. I haven't explored Oceans as much as I have the other evolution games yet because it only came out this year and I haven't had too many opportunities. Um, I can't rave about the game enough, really. The, the artwork is stunning. Um, it's got this beautiful sort of watercolour approach to it that's so unusual, looks so different to other games. Um, yeah, I, I, I just love it. I'm, I'm always up for games of evolution. I think um, North Star Games have done a stunning job with it. Um, and I think I'll be playing it for a long time to come. Okay, so there's our final 10 games. And let's see what the final outcome is. Who are my favourite publishers, designers, my favourite themes, my favourite game styles? Well, starting with the publishers, uh, Zoc Verlag was ahead between 11 and 100 with six games and then Rio Grande and Hansen Gluck on five, Smitschbieler and Lookout on four. So it's a close run thing for the publishers. What's happened? Zoc Verlag has got it. They've got it in the bag with seven games, Rio Grande with six, 
and Hans M. Gluck with five, and Lookout with five, Smitspiel and North Star doing very well with four games apiece. So congratulations to Zock Verlag, clearly my favourite publisher according to my top 100 games. Let's look at designers. Rainer Knizia was ahead with five over Wolfgang Kramer and Phil Walker-Harding with four each. Again, a close run thing. Can Rainer Knizia hold on to that lead in that final top ten? The answer is yes. He's pulled ahead even further. Six games now in the top 100 for Rainer Knizia. Wolfgang Kramer and Phil Walker-Harding following on four apiece. And then Andres, Andreas Seyfarth, Michael Kiesling, Bruno Catala, Uwe Rosenberg and Alnar Moon on three apiece. All wonderful, wonderful designers. Uh, themes. Fantasy was out ahead with the ancient world following and anthropomorphic animals. So what's happened now with regards to the themes? Uh, well, fantasy has held on to the lead. 11 games in the top 100 about fantasy. Ancient world on 8. Anthropomorphic animals on 8. If we add together anthropomorphic animals and regular animals, as I've talked about in previous videos, then they would beat fantasy, but I haven't. So fantasy is out ahead. As much as I would like to say, you know, I, I'm not a huge fantasy fan, I guess I am. Um, they may be just that there's so many fantasy games around that I, it's very hard for me to avoid them. Um, but you know, I haven't got any sci-fi on the list, have I? So, so I'm guessing that fantasy really is an interest of mine. I just hadn't really recognised it. Okay, looking at game styles. Well, tile laying was way ahead with 13 over time pressure on 8, area majority on 8, and party game on 6. Surely that can't change that situation? And the answer is no. Tile laying is still way out ahead with 14 games in the top 100, area majority on 9, time pressure on 8, Party games, network building, and engine building on six apiece. So, uh, so there we are. Tile laying games seems to be my favourite genre of games. Um, I don't know whether I would have guessed that. I, 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 I mean, it makes sense. I've got a lot of tile laying games. They keep coming out, don't they? They can't. No, they can't stop producing these polyomino games. They're constantly, constantly coming out. And actually, going back to when I mentioned Carcassonne earlier on in this list as being the first time, obviously I've been playing games my whole life, but this was the first time I'd really met a, you know, a, a modern hobby Euro type game, Carcassonne, and, and being amazed by that mechanism of building the board as you go, laying out the tiles, this idea of, you know, creating a, what I, I, I recognised as a jigsaw, but we all play it together competitively, a competitive jigsaw. And yet, you know, I've got 14 of these games on this list now. 14 games that use similar mechanisms that I've picked up since that first uh, entry point with Carcassonne. Um, so it, it just shows how how sort of pivotal that game is, really, and how defining that, that game is, um, and, and why it's really stood the test of time. Anyway, I hope you found this list interesting. I found it really entertaining to make uh, and to find out a little bit more about my tastes and uh, my biases and so on and so forth. And I've enjoyed interacting with everybody in the comments each day. Um, so but if you enjoyed it, please watch some of my other videos. I've got loads of videos about game design, top tens um, uh, of different games, some reviews on my channel, plenty of videos to get stuck into. So watch my YouTube channel, Adam's Board Game Wales, and please subscribe. Follow me on Board Game Geek. I'm Adam78. On Twitter, I'm at Board Game Wales. Thanks very much for watching. All the best.